and welcome to Ye Old Bestsellers Book Club, where I am reading through some of America's earliest best-selling novels, as reported by The Bookman, a literary magazine of the 1890s. Today's book is The Pride of Jenico, a romance adventure by Agnes and Egerton Castle. The Castles were a married couple who had dabbled in solo works before Jenico, but they weren't known as writers. They would go on to publish a lot of co-authored works after this, but Jenico was their first together. Agnes actually came from a family full of writers, especially two of her sisters, and Egerton was a huge fencing nerd. That was actually one of his solo projects. He wrote a big fencing compendium. You would think that that knowledge might add something to a book that has multiple duels in it with swords, but unfortunately you would be wrong. I am getting ahead of myself. The protagonist of our story is Basil Jenico or perhaps Basil Jenico. I am tempted to call him Bezazel, but that would probably be annoying. Basil feels more English, and he is that, so I guess that's what I'll go for. Whatever his name is, he is a 26-year-old gentleman of good breeding, born in the mid-1700s, who has spent most of his adulthood in military service across Europe, following in the footsteps of his great-uncle, who is this 73-year-old, gnarled old soldier. He's missing all of his, quote, most ornamental teeth, end quote. He's got an eye patch and a walking stick, and he is obsessed with the Jenico family name and the history of his lineage. Quote, the worship of the name was with him an absolute craze. End quote. So much so that when Basil's older brother marries a beautiful rich woman, quote, about whose lineage it seems altogether unadvisable to seek clear information, end quote, acquires a title by possibly dubious means, I honestly can't tell, and worst of all, changes his name. These offenses against the family are so enraging that the great uncle dies within weeks of learning about it. He is technically killed by gout of the stomach, but I think that's just because it's medically complicated to diagnose someone with fatally wounded pride. Basil is summoned to attend his grunkle's deathbed. Quote, thou shalt have it all, was the first thing he whispered to me as I knelt by his side. He caught at me with his claw-like hand, cold already with the very chill of the earth. Remember that thou the last Jenico bist, royal blood, bring no rotirier into the family, end quote. I don't speak French, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say rotirier, but it means commoner, or lowborn. Don't be like your brother. Since his great-uncle has no sons and only one tolerable nephew, Basil inherits all of the fortune he had amassed over the years. Millions in Florence, the castle of Tollenthal, and all its accompanying swaths of land in Central Europe. There are forests and towns and fields and vineyards and, quote, females of all ages whose bare feet in summer patter oddly on the floor like the tread of animals, end quote. Okay. As he settles into life as master of Tolentall, Basil spends a lot of days wandering amongst the farms and little villages, basking in the rustic idleness that he now holds dominion over. And on one of these afternoons, he is taking a nap just off the road, dreaming of Marie Antoinette, when he is awoken by two female voices. At first, when he opens his eyes into the full glare of the sun, the woman leaning over him is, quote, outlined it seemed in fire and shimmering between black and gold. My next glance filled me with a woeful disappointment. What I beheld was but a slim slip of a creature who, from the tip of her somewhat battered shepherdess hat to the hem of her loosely hanging skirts, gave me an impression of being all yellow, save for the dark cloud of her hair. Her skin seemed golden yellow like old ivory, her eyes seemed to shoot yellow sparks, her gown was yellow as any primrose, end quote. She's untidy, grimy, kind of sunburnt. His half-asleep brain is still focused on Marie Antoinette, so he was hoping for someone hotter. When he looks over and sees the source of the second female voice, he finds the beauty he had been hoping for. This woman has an air of dignity and poise about her. There are pearls on her neck and gloves on her hands. Her clothes are trying to look simple, but can't hide that they are richly made. The damsel of the yellow skirts introduces her companion as Her Serene Highness the Princess Marie Caroline Dorothy Josephine Charlotte Autillier of Lausitz, and herself also as Marie Autillier. They are both named Marie Autillier. 
Later, the not-princess one is called Marie Atelier Pollen, but she almost exclusively goes by just Atelier. Not sure what's up with that. I guess I don't know enough about how 18th century European last names work. I'm going to call them Atelier and the princess and hope I don't make things confusing. Basil tries to introduce himself all pompous, peacocking for the princess. Look at all the land that I have. I'm so important. And Atelier turns it all into a joke, doing silly impressions, conducting mock ceremony, completely butchering his name on purpose from here on out. He finds her very obnoxious. I do think she's funny. She does explain why a princess is just wandering around the country backroads, mostly unattended, in a territory that does not even belong to her family. They've been on the run from smallpox, hopping from place to place, but it keeps following them, and at this point they've had to send away most of their entourage because they keep getting infected. So the princess has been left unprecedentedly unsupervised, and the girls have gotten very bored. Basil is, of course, very eager to offer some entertainment. He has very quickly become smitten by the princess, who has said maybe two words to him. But she's pretty and noble, so he invites them to visit his vineyards the next day and his castle, and he shows them all his antiques, his paintings, his relics. Ottilia he still finds very obnoxious. She's unreserved and unabashed. She mingles with the peasants as though she were one of them. Meanwhile, the princess is still very quiet, maybe even a little haughty, but Basil convinces himself that's fine. Surely it befits one of her station. He starts to fantasize that, sure, a princess shouldn't marry the likes of him, it would be such a step down, but he's wealthy and well-connected, and isn't the Genico name worthy of even a royal match? Quote, it was not long before Mademoiselle Ottilier discovered the secret madness of my thoughts, and she it was who, for purposes of her own, shoveled coals on the fire and fanned the flame, end quote. One day, she outright says, quote, why not? The whole room whirled round with me. My God, I cried, don't mock me. But she, with a new ring of feeling in her voice, said earnestly, she has such misery before her if her father carries out his will, end quote. This doesn't get explained further until later, but the princess has a cousin back home that her father wants her to marry. He's a prince, so a suitable fit, but not a man that she wants. Basil, though, Ottilie thinks would be a better fit for her mistress. She sees him once riding his horse, and notes that he is kind and gentle and patient. Though he has spurs on, he doesn't use them, even when the horse is disobedient. He has a merciful heart. Quote, I know a man in our own country who passes for the finest, the bravest, the most gallant. He is greatly admired by everyone, but his horses die, and his hounds shrink when he moves his hand. That is what my country people call being manly, being a real cavalier, end quote. Basil hems and haws, he frets, but eventually he writes a letter proclaiming his love and offering the princess a marriage. And she writes back, quote, Since you love me, and since you honor me by telling me so, I will be honest with you and tell you that my present life has no charm for me. I am willing to trust myself to you and to your promises, rather than face the lot already drawn for me. Marie Ottilier. There was no hint of answering love to my passionate declaration, but I did not miss it. I had won my princess, end quote. He and Ottilia meet up at one point to discuss the logistics of this wedding. It's going to have to be done with a lot of secrecy. Lucky for Basil, she has already planned the whole thing out, and as she goes to leave, quote, I took her hand, touched by her accent of earnestness, and gratefully awoke to the fact that she alone had made the impossible possible to my desire. I looked at her face close to mine in the faint light, and as she smiled at me, a little sadly, I was struck with the delicate beauty of the curve of her lip and the exquisite finishing touch of the dimple that came and went beside it. She slipped her hand from mine as I would have kissed it. Goodbye, gallant cavalier, she said mockingly, end quote. Well, time to go get married to someone else and not think about that at all even a little bit. Basil is delivered on the night of his wedding to the dark church of a small village in the midst of a storm. In the few steps he takes between the carriage and the church door, his clothes are stained with mud and his neatly powdered hair is blown into disarray. 
Within, it is, quote, cold and damp, with a death-like closeness after the warm, blustering air I had just left. Its sole illumination from the faint glow of the little sanctuary lamp and the sullen yellow flame of two or three tallow candles stuck on spikes. In the silence of the church, the most poverty-stricken and desolate, the most miserable, the most ruined to yet be used as the house of God I think I had ever entered, at the foot of the altar of my faith a sudden misgiving seized upon me. How would all this end? I was going to bind myself for life with the most solemn vows. Would all the honour and glory of the Alliance compensate me for the loss of my liberty? A fresh clamour of opening doors, and a light, sedate footfall struck my ear, and all doubt and dismay disappeared like magic. Closely enveloped in the folds of a voluminous dark velvet cloak, with its hood drawn forward over her head, I knew the stately height of my bride as she advanced towards me. She stood beside me, and as the words were spoken, I thought no more of the mean surroundings, of the evil omens, of the responsibilities and consequences of my act. I had no thought to spare for the position of my bride herself, no feeling of tenderness for the touching character of her confidence in me, no doubt as to her future happiness as my wife. My whole soul was possessed with triumph, end quote. Truly, Basil, what a catch this man is. If he can land a princess, what excuse do you have? Basil slips a ring on his lady's finger, they sign their names, and return to the carriage, man and wife. He takes her hand, quote, I lifted it, spread out the little, long, thin fingers. Too often had I kissed the dimpled, firm hand of Her Serene Highness not to know the difference. This was my wife's hand, there was my ring, but who was my wife, end quote? This hand belongs to another. And as he sits, processing his shock, the lady pulls back her veil and reveals, quote, the features of Ottilie, the lady-in-waiting. I must have stared like a madman. For very fear of my own violence, I dared not move or speak. Madame de Genico very composedly removed her veil from her hair, pushed back her hood, and withdrew the hand, which I still unconsciously clutched. Then she turned and looked at me, as if waiting for me to speak first. I said in a sort of whisper, "'What does this mean?' "'It means, Monsieur de Genico, that, for your own good, you have been deceived.' The strenuous control I was endeavouring to put upon my seething passion of fury and bewilderment broke down. I threw up my arms, the natural gesture of a man driven beyond bounds, and as I did so felt the figure beside me make a sudden abrupt movement. I thought that she shrank from me, that she feared lest I, I, Basil Jenico, would strike her, a woman, end quote. Excuse me, what were you saying about barely restrained violence two whole seconds ago? He is filled with just the bitterest contempt that she might fear such a thing from him. As we all know, Englishmen are, quote, incapable of harshness to a woman, end quote. That is genuinely a thing written into this book. I don't have a comment to make about it. I'm just going to let it hang. Atelier isn't even actually scared of him, by the way. He just jumped to conclusions and got mad about nothing. When he finds his words, he asks her why, and she claims it was all the princess's plan to see her dear lady-in-waiting settled in life. Later, she will claim that the princess had nothing to do with it. Actually, the story fluctuates and is always sort of vague. Quote, you know, I said at last, that this is no marriage. How, sir, she cried, has not the priest wedded us? Have we not together received a most solemn sacrament? End quote. I don't know the intricacies of 18th century marriage law, but I assume there is some clause for fraud. And Basil agrees, he thinks to himself that it is on, quote, his pleasure to acknowledge the validity of this marriage, end quote. But he's already told all of the staff he was bringing home a wife to open himself up to the ridicule of having been tricked, to admit to his disappointment, acknowledge her victory. No, that would be too easy, and there would be no revenge in that. He resolves to go along with it for a while, take her home, act as though nothing is amiss, and then, quote, afterwards, when I had tamed that insolent spirit, 
Oh, I smiled to myself as I laid that plan which was full as cruel as the deception that had been practiced upon me, end quote. He will conquer Autelier, and only once he is ready to sell Tolland Hall and all its land and return to England forever, where no one will know what happened, then he will follow through on his promise that this was no true marriage. And as he is sitting here, stewing in his thoughts of vengeance, Autelier offers another explanation for why she tricked him. Quote, I liked you besides too well to see you unhappily married, and the other Autelier would have made you a wretched wife. I burst out laughing, and she fell to laughing too, and as she laughed and I looked at her, knowing her now my own, I deemed I had never seen a woman laugh to such bewitching purpose. And though I was full of my cruel intent, and though I dubbed her false and shameless and as deceitful a little cat as ever a man could meet, yet the dimple drew me, and I put my arms around her and kissed it. As my lips touched hers, I knew I was a lost man, end quote. Ottilier comes home with him, dines at his table, and lives at his castle, and while the plan ever lingers in the back of his mind, quote, I found myself a slave. And slave of what? A dimple, a pair of yellow eyes veiled by long black lashes, a saucy child, end quote. Can I, for just a second? I am starting to keep a tally in my head of female love interest tropes that keep coming up in these books, and this book hits pretty much all of them. Unfortunately, comparing my woman to a child is, I think, the most common across the board. I feel like that's been in almost all of them. There's also the oh, women just have so many gosh darn emotions thing. Atelier has this one too. They are so unpredictable. I cannot keep up with their many moods for I am merely a man. That one sometimes gets the woman labeled as childish double whammy. There's also an obsession with tiny hands and feet, Basil has that, which was an unexpected disappointment because a point is made about both Ateliers being tall, so they're not petite in every way, and I got my hopes up. My bad, I guess. But he refers to Atelier as childish at least 13 times. Quote, I found her emanate an atmosphere not only of childlike innocence, but of lofty purity that often made me blush for my grosser imaginings. End quote. And, quote, she looked all a child as she slept, her face small and pale and tired. End quote. And I just wish he wouldn't. They have a lovely honeymoon phase, they get on very well, and Basil decides that actually he does love her, so judgmental ghost of his great uncle be damned, quote, I resolve to sacrifice my pride and keep my low-born wife, end quote. But instead of just shutting up and being happy with what he's got, Basil decides he needs to have a serious talk with Artelier to make sure she realizes how benevolent he's being. Quote, I would have had her grateful to me, conscious of her own sin and my generosity. End quote. He keeps trying to bring this up, but she's too busy making jokes and sticking twigs in her hair to have an earnest conversation until eventually Basil snaps. Quote, it is time to be serious, I said, and struck the table with my flat palm. Well, let us be serious, she retorted, slapping the table too, and then sat down beside me, propping her chin upon her hands. Well, Mr. My Husband, what do you wish of me? End quote. Gratefulness, for one, but also some family history. He wants to know who her parents were. Her father, she says, was a doctor. Such a lowly commoner's profession that Basil drops his pen in shock. But her mother, her mother was a mere maid. Quote, I sat like a man struck silly, and in the tide of fury that swept over me, my single lucid thought was that if I spoke or moved, I should disgrace myself, end quote. Yet, sure, she has no reason to be concerned about your anger issues. Surely, she says, if he loves her, this shouldn't matter. But this, of all things, this is asking too much. After everything she has done to him, she is also the child of a doctor? Quote, I thought you could rise above so pitiable a weakness. If you can lay bare your soul now and tell yourself that you would rather have had the wife you wanted in your overweening vanity than the wife I am to you, why, then, sir, I have made a grievous mistake. 
Come, Basil, rise above this failing which is so unworthy of you. What does it mean that you can trace your family up to a greater number of probable rascals, hard and selfish men, than another? I tell you that if I love you, I love you for what you are, not because you are descended from some ignorant, savage king. I sprang to my feet, to be thus rated by her who should be kneeling for forgiveness. End quote. And Basil reminds her of his threat from that night in the carriage. It is by his choice, his generosity, that this marriage is a marriage. Quote, she put her hands to her head like one who had turned suddenly giddy. You married me before God's altar. You married me and you took me home. With a bitter laugh, I married the princess, I said, but I took the servant home. End quote. Atelier storms out of the room, and Basil storms out of the castle entirely. He goes to stay at his hunting lodge for a few days, and he goes through waves of feeling, brooding by himself. He starts angry and resentful, determined to make her repent, and then it morphs to remorseful, guilty, and desperate for her forgiveness. He braves a dangerous winter storm to get back to Tollentall, but when he bursts into Atelier's bedroom, quote, the room was all empty and all dark. There was no trace of her presence. Her bed had not been slept in. Like a maniac, I tore about the house, shrieking her name, and at last Janosch gave me the tidings that the gracious lady had gone, end quote, and she has left her wedding ring behind. I haven't mentioned Janosch yet. He is one of my favorite characters in the book. He's sort of a personal bodyguard slash main attendant for Basil, just like he was for his great uncle before him. Basically, he follows Basil around solving all of his problems and generally being the most sensible person in the room. Basil wants to go after Ottilier immediately, but the storm is only getting worse. It keeps him trapped in Tollentall for days, but the moment he can leave, he and Janosch are in pursuit. They track her all the way to Lausitz, the domain of the princess's father. Ottilier has apparently gone back to her mistress, but when Basil and Janosch arrive at the gates of the castle that the princess and her ladies are supposed to be in, it is in strict quarantine. Smallpox is still raging in this country, so so for the safety of Her Royal Highness, outsiders are not allowed in. But Basil is allowed to send in a letter. He writes out a desperate plea for forgiveness and addresses it to Madame Ottilia de Genico. And before handing it over, he lays a kiss on her name, which he thinks no one is watching him do. He is wrong. Three hours later, the letter is returned to him unread. None of Her Highness's ladies were willing to claim it because none of them bear the name Jenico. So he crosses that part out and writes down her maiden name and adds even more desperate pleading. But half an hour later, it is returned again with a firm request that he stop annoying Her Highness's ladies. So he sends Janosch to a different gate to see if he can get a message to the princess herself. And he receives in return... An armed escort across the border and a, quote, formal warning to Monsieur de Genico never to set foot more within the dominions of the Duke of Lausitz, severe penalty, and so forth, end quote. Now, Basil had thought that he might never be able to go home to England ever again. It's his own damn fault. He had promised Ottilier, when he still thought he was going to marry a princess, that he wouldn't tell anyone about the impending wedding. And then he immediately wrote a letter to his mom about it, and she can't keep a secret either. So everyone back home would be expecting him to return with a fancy bride. Quote, but when I found the desolation and the haunting memories of Tollentall like to rob me of all I had left of reason and manliness, the thought of home seemed to promise some chance of diversion and relief, end quote. So he does go back to England, and it's actually fine. He is the subject of a lot of gossip, but people are tactful enough not to mention the rumors of his failed love directly to his face, and they don't know the details, so if anything he is just shrouded in intrigue and mystery. Heaven forbid he face consequences for his own actions. He spends his time on gambling and sport, trying to keep distracted. Once he receives a messenger from Ottilier herself, it's the first contact he's had from her, and it is a request that they both file for an annulment of their marriage, which he tears violently into pieces. He is also the victim of multiple assassination attempts. He just keeps getting shot at, even through the windows of his own home. He goes to London, hoping that that will be safer, and gets stabbed in the street by a guy with a sword. 
and when he meets up with his gambling friends later that very night, still wearing his blood-stained clothes, one of his friends is acting weird. He's a foreigner of the pale European variety, handsome with an almost sinister smile, and tonight he is itching for a fight. He ends up insulting Basil harshly enough that a duel is arranged the following morning. Now, Basil is at a firm disadvantage here. He is a very talented duelist, but that stab wound is very fresh, and it's making him really stiff. He knows that his chances are slim, and yet, come morning, he is unsettlingly calm. The fight begins, and, quote, This is no courteous duel between gentlemen, but the struggle of a man with his murderer. Against this brute fury, all my skill at arms is of no avail, and my strength is rapidly failing. The next moment, with an extraordinary sense of universal failure and disorganization, which is not yet pain, I realize that I am hit, badly hit, end quote. His opponent pants out Artillier's name, and then Basil plunges into dark delirium. He should be dead. Even after he went down, his opponent didn't stop stabbing. And yet, he wakes up in the home of one of his other friends, and they explain that, as far as anyone else knows, Basil Jenico was killed in that duel. They thought that story would keep him safe, because clearly someone wants him dead. Who, though, is Basil's question. This man had seemed genuinely angry and hateful. There was bloodlust there. And worse, something about him looked familiar. A dimple in the cheek, something about the smile. He looks like Autelier. And clearly, he knows her. He said her name. So is she involved? Is she responsible for these attempts on his life? As soon as he is physically able, Basil and Janosch set off for Lausitz, the territory which he was told never to return to, seeking answers, and depending on what he learns, quote, I would try to win her back were I to die in the attempt, or thrust her from my life forever, end quote. This is complicated, though, because not only is Autelier probably in the very well-guarded palace with the princess, he also has to be very careful that no one recognizes him and realizes that Basil Jenico is not, in fact, dead. But he gets comically lucky. Autelier has an old nurse named Anna, who has been with her since the beginning, and I mean that in both a literally breastfed Autelier as a baby way and a has been present since the start of the book way. They're very close. Anna is very protective, and probably as a result of that, she has always been very cold towards Basil. Not usually speaking to him, but scowling ominously from the edge of various scenes. Basil now runs into Anna, literally, in the street, and for some reason she's just okay with him now. Like, she kisses his hand, the disdain is completely gone, she's actually very helpful, and agrees to deliver a message to Autelier. And while he's waiting to hear back, she says he should lay low, which sounds very sensible, since people want him dead. But then Janosch brings him the news from his own investigations that Marie Autelier Palin has married the court physician, which is allowed, as far as anyone knows she's a widow. Janosch says it's a lost cause. Basil's gonna get himself killed if he tries to get involved. They should just go home. But then he also tells Basil the physician's address. Janosch, you have met this man. You know what he is like. Why would you do that and then think that you could get him to leave? You are not usually stupid. Of course Basil shows up two minutes later on the physician's doorstep, fully prepared to stab someone if he has to, looking for his wife. Widow. Whatever. He is let in by a maid who goes to fetch her mistress. The physician is not home. Quote, then was the door opened, and before me stood not Autelier, who had been my Autelier, but the other Autelier, the princess. All at once she halted. God be merciful to us, Monsieur de Genico, and seemed the next instant ready to burst into tears, end quote. Basil demands to see his wife, her lady-in-waiting, as she collapses, crying into the nearest chair, and says, quote, Is it possible, Monsieur de Genico, that you have not found out yet, that you do not suspect? I needed no further word, I knew. How is it possible, indeed, that I should not have known before? I saw as in a flash that this comely burgher woman was not, had never been, never could have been, the princess. 
I saw that the hand I still unconsciously held bore the marks of household toil, that on the third finger glittered a new wedding ring. Oh, blind, blind, blind that I had been! The mystery of my wife's mocking smile, her careless pretty ways, the manner in which she had been guarded from me, the force employed against me, end quote. The princess had never been the princess at all. His atelier had been the princess, and they had lied because reasons. Apparently, Atelier lied at first just on a whim, which honestly does seem in character. She probably thought it was fun to play a different part, one with lower expectations, and then she started concocting her plan to escape from a bad marriage to her terrible cousin. But she wanted to know that Basil could love her beyond his obsession with pedigree, and so the lie continued. The plan itself is ridiculous, but if it all goes to shit, Princess is a pretty solid safety net she can fall back on. The false princess insists she is certain Atelier didn't have anything to do with the attempts on his life. She puts the blame on her highness's cousin, the Prince Eugen, the man her father wants her to marry, who just so happens to have come back from England recently with the news of Basil Jenico's death. Not suspicious at all. She also says that Atelier was devastated hearing that he had died, that she had never received any of the messages Basil had tried to send after their fight, and had only sent the annulment request, quote, to free you because she believed you repented of it and she felt she had entrapped you into it. And when, sir, you refused, she had hope again in her heart for she loved you, and she suffered persecution on your account, but she held firm and bore it all in silence, end quote. I have mixed feelings on the princess twist. On one hand, I get why it would have been written. I can see why it's fun. But on the other hand, I don't love that Basil gets rewarded for overcoming his faults and being able to accept his marriage to a commoner with a wife who's actually secret royalty. I wanted his great uncle to be rolling in his grave about his two nephews and their low-born ladies, and this is just that man's wildest dream come true. Now, overjoyed to learn that Atelier loves him after all, Basil and Janosch immediately start planning Operation Kidnap My Wife Back. They're gonna steal her right out of the palace. But there is just one problem. They don't know anything about the palace, how to get in, where exactly she would be. If only Basil had spoken literally that morning with someone intimately close to the princess who could maybe help them. Someone who, I don't know, said that they would come back later, who they should maybe wait for, if only such a person existed. So Anna comes back. And she is very upset that he has spoken with the false princess, not because he now knows the truth about his wife, but because the false princess is apparently a blabbermouth with a Eugen loyalist husband, so they have until maybe tomorrow before everyone knows that Basil's not dead and people come to kill him. This is why you should listen to Anna. Luckily, she is willing to help with Operation Kidnap My Wife Back, and this makes it all just comically easy, to the point that it's boring. She comes up with the whole plan, she knows all the palace schedules, she has a key to an unguarded door that gets them into the courtyard, why does that exist? She personally escorts Basil inside and points out which balcony is Atelier's, and it all works flawlessly. Basil climbs up the ivy to her balcony and peers in through Atelier's bedroom window, and he's supposed to wait until Anna can guarantee it's safe, but then Atelier turns and meets his eye, and he loses all control. One moment he's outside, the next, quote, I suppose I must have hurled myself against the casement. The lock yielded and the window flew open. Enveloped in a whirl of floating snow, I leaped into the warm room, end quote. Now, I have screamed in terror because I walked into the kitchen and a person was there. A person who lives in the same house as me, who is in that kitchen every day. I just wasn't ready to see a person in that moment for some reason. One time, I saw my grandma standing in her own driveway and was so startled I nearly fell over. What were we talking about? 
Oh, yeah, if Basil body slammed his way through my bedroom window out of nowhere, people would hear about it on the other side of the palace. But thankfully, Atelier is more composed than I am. She does not blow their cover. Instead, she just, quote, flung herself melting into tears, body and soul, as it were, upon my heart, end quote. Anna comes in not long after, they explain the plan, and Atelier is on board to run away. Getting her down off the balcony is made way more complicated than breaking into the entire palace was. There's a whole thing with a homemade rope ladder. Basil has to test it first to make sure it's safe, and then he makes a whole production about showing her how to hold it and where to put her feet, and then he climbs down beside her the whole way down on the ivy so that he can, quote, guide the slender body down each swinging rung, end quote. Her bedroom is on the second goddamn floor. I don't know how tall the ground level is, but it cannot be tall enough to justify this. It is a ladder, Basil. She will figure it out. Calm down. Anna has arranged for a covered wagon to sneak them out of the city. It's full of fresh hay and pre-stocked with ham, wine, and blankets because Anna is wonderful and has thought of everything. Basil and Atelier snuggle up together in the dark, hiding under mountains of hay, giggling like mischievous schoolchildren. Once they've ridden safely outside of the city, they all break bread and toast wine by lantern light to the smell of Janosch smoking up front. It's honestly very cozy. I like the atmosphere of this sequence. That's one thing I do like about this book in general. While the writing and wordcraft itself is not super remarkable, there were a lot of scenes that I felt had a really distinct mood, and they had visuals and sensory descriptions that stuck with me for whatever reason, and this is one of them. The wedding was another. The group has to make a couple stops throughout the night to swap vehicles and get fresh horses, but everything is calm. As far as they know, no one is yet aware that the princess is missing. But as dawn breaks, they hear galloping behind their coach, quote, a flying figure that grew every second larger and blacker against the white expanse beneath us was rushing up towards us with almost incredible swiftness, end quote. Basil jumps out of the coach and, quote, no sooner had I touched the ground than out of space, as it were, roaring and reeking, hugely black against the sunshine, the horse and rider were upon me. The rider's face, outlined against the horse's steaming neck, bent towards me. Prince Eugens, ensanguined, distorted with fury, glowing with vindictive triumph. The red face became blocked from my view by a fist outstretched, and I found myself looking down the black mouth of a pistol barrel, end quote. Basil deflects one shot with his sword, shattering the blade and spraining his wrist. Janosch returns fire and takes down Eugens' horse, but once again the prince raises his pistol. Basil, quote, stood dizzily facing my doom. Then, for a third time, the air rang with a shattering explosion. The prince flung both arms up, and I saw his great body founder head foremost, a mere mass of clay, almost at my feet. I turned again, and there was my Janosch, with the smoking musketoon still to his cheek, and there also my wife, with the face of an avenging angel, one hand upon his shoulder, and the other still pointing at the space beyond me, where but a second before stood the enemy who had held my life on the play of his forefinger." End quote. Basil is now 0 for 2 on winning a fight with Prince Eugen. If Janosch were not here, he would 100% have been killed. It's kind of weird that Basil basically never solves his own problems. He makes bad choices and then escapes the consequences by pure luck, or when that fails, someone else fixes it for him. He was also set up as a talented duelist. We were told that he can fight very well. And given that one of the authors of this book fences as his main hobby, I don't know, I expected maybe some fun action or something. But this scene just felt really anticlimactic. And it is the climax of the story, but there's no character dynamics in it, there's no emotion besides, oh no, I might get shot, Eugen feels wasted, there are years of disdain and unrequited love, apparently, between him and Ottilie. He was briefly Basil's friend in England under a false identity, and then he betrayed him. I feel like there are relationships here that could be made interesting, and they're just not. 
There's nothing that Eugen does in this scene that couldn't have been done by just a really angry dog. That's my new version of the sexy lamp test. Ottilia doesn't even speak. All she did was point at Eugen, as though Janosch couldn't have figured out who to shoot by himself. Even Basil does basically nothing except sprain his wrist, and then it's over. Basil and Ottilia return to Talent Hall as man and wife. The public story, as printed in the news sheets, is that Eugen died from a hunting accident falling off his horse, and Ottilia has run off to join a convent with the permission of her father. Quote, Since the events which had first divided and then reunited us forever, I had not yet been able to find in the sweet, silent, docile woman I had snatched back to my heart the willful Ottilia of old. Her spirits seem to have been sobered, her gaiety, her petulance to have been lost, but now, as we stood together, I saw a spark of the old mockery leap into her eyes, end quote. She calls him affectionately by the wrong name, like she did when they first met. She smiles, quote, and I know not what came upon me, for there are joys so subtle that they on man even as sorrows, but I fell at her feet with tears, end quote. And that is the end. Basil did just bring up for me a complaint that I've had. Ottilia used to be fun. She can be kind of a jerk, but she was always clever and proactive and snarky. She didn't mind getting her hands dirty, but once we learned that she's a princess and they were reunited, she was basically just a prop with very little personality. I can understand that she might act different. Circumstances have changed, time has passed, but she is the emotional core of the story, and the last thing she should be is bland and boring. And I don't understand why the choice was made to remove all of the things about her that made her interesting and likable. Evidently changed very on purpose, because the text itself is pointing it out. Anyway, there is a review of this book in the June 1898 edition of the Bookman magazine. Quote, a real love story is almost the rarest thing in literature. Its achievement is the aim of 99 out of 100 novelists, yet the whole field of fiction is crowded with failures. It is not easy to understand just why it should be so difficult to realize in fiction one of the most familiar facts of life, for although there may be here and there lucky men and luckier women who are not cursed with a capacity for the grand passion, there can hardly be a man or a woman who has not encountered the beautiful, terrible thing in some form. An exception appears now and then to prove the rule and to be hailed with delight, and the most recent and most notable instance is the pride of Jenico. The names of the authors are unfamiliar. The tale is not especially well written, although the work is good. It is not particularly original, although the motive is by no means hackneyed. It is neither uncommonly large, nor wide, nor deep. The story's irresistible charm is the charm of young lovers. There are many amusing complications, and humor of the sweetest, most spontaneous kind is one of the characteristics of the work. The work is singularly free from morbidity. It is wholesome and sunny as the first of May, and driven now and then by a gust of March, as true love should be. Altogether, the best love story in many a month, Nancy Houston Banks, end quote. And I do share at least a generally similar opinion, in that I think it was fine, but not spectacular, with some writing flaws, and what charm it did have lay mostly in the humor and the relationship between Basil and Ottilier. I'm not a big romance person, and I think they were at their best when they both acted like they kind of hated each other, but they were fun sometimes, and I liked how they interacted. Which, in turn, is the source of one of my other complaints. A good chunk of this book does not have Ottilier in it at all. Like, not that far from half. And it just never felt like anything else stepped in to compensate. It sagged a little through the middle, especially in England. There were scenes, moments, characters that I enjoyed, but something was missing. A different, more brief blurb about the book, also from the Bookman magazine, said, quote, The Pride of Jenico is the best of its kind since The Prisoner of Zenda, end quote. And that is actually something I wanted to talk about already. 
These are both books whose title is the word that starts with P of a name, with a protagonist that starts as a relatively unimportant English gentleman who ends up in a German-speaking part of Europe, takes a nap in the woods at the start of the book, during which he dreams about romancing a royal lady, before he is woken up by two people who stumbled upon him by happenstance and then kickstart his involvement in the main plot of the novel. The protagonist falls in love with a princess, somebody lies about their identity and pretends to be someone they're not, and there's some riding around on horseback trying to kill each other with swords and guns. I don't want to accuse Jenico of being a ripoff. The details are very different, but that is a lot of similarities. But this comparison got me thinking about what I wished Jenico had done better. Jenico felt like a romance with an adventure that was sometimes underdeveloped and not used to its full potential. Zenda was a solid adventure with a romance that often felt underdeveloped and not used to its full potential. But that element took much more of a backseat role. I didn't care about it that much, but it never monopolized the story. It was background to the things that Zenda did well. Jenico spends a lot of time on its shenanigans. It felt like it wanted to sometimes be an action story, but almost didn't quite know how. There was just something missing, and I think that's a shame. I think it put a lot of things on the table that had promise, but sometimes just didn't follow through as much as it could have. There's no one big fault I want to point at, and generally I did think it was fun, but it had room for improvement. And that about covers it, I think, so I hope I'll catch you in the next one, and in the meantime you can catch me at Yobbpod, Y-O-B-B-P-O-D, on all the social media things. And for today's life advice from the past, don't try to force your daughter to marry her cousin. It's gonna cause a lot of headache for everyone involved. It's just not worth it. <laughs>